Five. So we're just, hi folks, welcome to I'm the Nuclear Proctologist.org. My name is Dana Durnford. This is Terry Daniels. Terry went down on the beaches and took all the photos, and he's also funded the computers, the wire cast, and many other things. $600 of the donation is what started this all off from you guys at the Nuclear Proctologist. And so we rented a boat. And we'll jump on that. And we went up to the very furthest one, which is Desolation Sound. And we covered 200 kilometers. And we caught nine days at low tides. And each day was a lower tide than the day before because of the super moon that we have today, right? And so the last day was yesterday. We covered a mass amount of coastline. We rented a Zodiac and covered around 40 kilometers of Desolation Sound area in a three hour ride. At low tide we see no life whatsoever. We see no kelp forest. We see no habitat. We see no bull kelp. We see no sea anemones. We see four species. The ocean is still trying to survive. But we see none of these species. These are all species that normally are populating our coastline. And so in a few minutes, we're going to go offline for 10 minutes, but I'm going to walk you through this for the first few minutes, and then I'll explain that to you. You see, this is low tide line. This is a normal habitat. This is something I've done for 14 years, and it's something I understand that uh, the ocean cannot exist if that doesn't exist. And what happens is we found four species. So we're going to cover that over the next hour and a half. And those four species were uniform through to 200 kilometer zone and this is the Georgia Strait we're talking about in British Columbia Canada and for comparisons the big island right here is Vancouver Island is 460 kilometers long and the fact that we found none of these species we have around 5,000 species we found no sea anemones anywhere we went we found only purple starfish now this is not a picture of that this is what it looks like in the nature. Now look at all the, the kelp and the algae. Kelp is algae. There's 600 species of it. All of those were missing except for two. This was known as common kelp, also known as kelp weed. It's like popcorn. And the other one is a cabbage kelp. None of these that you see in the picture here were found in 200 kilometers. We're talking about a total annihilation of uh, sea anemones. Now here's a good example of what I saw every day. We see no crows on the beaches, no, no eagles. We see no insects on the highways and on the beaches. So knowing all of that, and it doesn't stop deer, we see no whelks. We see no sand dollars. We see um, no um, no snails, the indigenous populated snails. And like once again, that was the picture of the Wilkes. But most importantly, at the low tide line, we don't see the sea anemones, and they usually attach to everything. And this is what I'm used to seeing my whole life as a commercial diver. So knowing what you know right now, and knowing that we cover 200 kilometers of coastline, knowing that there's 182 of you watching this right now, we're going to extend the presentation to two hours. We're going to cover around 16 samples and show you the desolation left behind. But and we're going to go off and make a cup of tea, let everybody settle down, and contact people. Phone up your TV stations, phone up your radio stations. And they might not get online right now, and they might. But they might put us up on websites, they might feature us. We need alternative media to feature this video. And as I explain this to you, I want you to understand that the ocean is still trying but it can't survive if we don't stop the Fukushima. Even if it's still trying, it doesn't matter if we don't try to stop Fukushima, which is the moral ethical thing to do. Because we have wiped out around 5,600 species in the low tidal, intertidal areas. You'll find links below to the government sites. So we're going to go off for 10 minutes. We want you to go out and spam for at least five of those minutes. Get yourself a cup of tea like we're doing. We're going to come back here and do the presentation. And remember this, there's 4,300 peer review academic studies every day. If we'd done every single day 4,300 studies, at the end of the week we would all feel a lot better. 
We had 4,300 studies on water, how to purify it. We had 4,300 studies on how to deal with it. We had 4,300 studies the next day, dedicated universities, institutions, professors, where we would have hope. And that's what we're going to have to take back, right? They have abrogated their responsibilities and hid it away from you. And that's not going to work no more. And what you're going to do now is you're going to go out there, you're going to contact radio stations in your community, mayors, doctors, lawyers, anybody you know with any influence whatsoever, any kind of common sense and sensibility, even if they've never seen the ocean before, it is incumbent upon you to try to bring them here. Just try. That's all we're asking. And if you have a website, if you're mainstream media, you, you should feature this so you can look back and say you tried because we will look back and say you didn't. Make no mistake about it. And we'll be back in about 10 minutes, folks. I'll pop back up here in a second. Just, just hit the refresh. It should be streaming. It'll quiet down here in a second. I'm just waiting for the stream to pop back up on the other screen. screen and we'll get started. We're going to go through, I'm just waiting to make sure I show up. I'll refresh that page, make sure everything is working for you guys. That's right, you just pulled out. And should show up here any minute. We took a 10 minute break here so people can call up people. And I'm just waiting for anybody to recognize us to say, yeah, you're back. Okay, we're back. The looks of it. Double check. That's Roger just pulled out. Yeah, okay, here we go again. If you're having a problem with the stream, we're streaming at 1280 and 720. And so lower your quality a bit and your computer will work a bit better if you don't have a dedicated graphic card. Just a quick synopsis and retake on what we covered in the first couple of minutes while we're waiting for people to come back is me and Terry we covered a roughly 200 kilometer stretch of the Strait of Georgia and what we were looking for was the indigenous marine life we took samples along the coastline for 200 kilometers over nine low tide periods and we found no life outside of four species we found no bull kelp anywhere we found none of the vegetation we certainly found none of the sea anemones, which is the green you're seeing over there. We found no sun starfish. We found none of all the, you see those stalks? They should show up on all the rocks on the low tide, and those sea anemones should too. These, are, this is a typical scenery. These tidal pools should be full of life. And around the rocks up close, it would look like that, totally full of life, and, and the dried up sacks you see they're the big sea anemones and when they flower and you'll see them at the low tide line everywhere you go in British Columbia and when they flower they'll flower up you'll see them a lot of the times looking like that but underwater once the water goes around them these little sacks will expand up but they're very visible at the low tide line and so we'll, we'll move ahead and here's some brightly colored ones that are typical of uh, tidal pools along the coastline at low tide. We covered nine days of low tide, the lowest tide each day. And this is the Wild West Coast. And so we're going to need to investigate all of that. Once again, there was no snails. There was no whelks. There was no other type of starfish, only the purple starfish. On the shorelines, there was no sea anemones. There was no mass populations of anything. In 200 kilometers, we could have took everything in a wheelbarrow in total that we've seen. There was none of the normal uh, tidal areas. There was nothing there in any place we went, in any of the pictures we took. There's over 600 species of algae, and there's, I think, 94 species of sponges. None of the sponges were there. Up at the high tide line, there was none of the sea anemones and there was no kelp grass in most of the places. There was some of this left, but there was no sea anemones whatsoever. At the super moon we had yesterday and last night with a 1.8 foot tide up at Gibson's Molly Reach, 
we were expecting to see some kinds of marine life in those areas and we see nothing. We never seen any insects uh, in the entire time except for maybe four flies. We seen probably five or ten um, wasps and bees in total in 200 kilometers. None hit our windshield when we were on the highway. None were embedded into the grills. These kelp forests, I used to dive in these kelp forests and get tangled up and I used to describe it like being caught in a spider web and I would take the regulator in my mouth and chew through the kelp to free myself up and that's not a joke. I used to spend six hours a day uh, and so I'm intimately you know I have an intimate knowledge of the ocean year after year 315 days a year up to six hours a day on the ocean floor I consider myself a connoisseur of mother nature and these are familiar sights to me and at low tide I expect to see these in 200 kilometers we never seen any of these. The fact that we never seen any of the kelp forest, the bull kelp forest which grows up to 60 feet in British Columbia, in a 40 kilometer uh, boat ride on the shoreline through Desolation Sound, we've seen a few strands of bull kelp. It's, it's like the ocean is still hanging on to four species. And we'll run through some more pictures. These are typical, you should see these sea anemones, these white ones on every wharf and every rock even if there's nothing in the bay and if not the very next bay should be completely loaded like you're seeing here now where it is, seems like there's too much well the entire coast is missing them and so these are filters do you see the little flowers that they're putting out right so when they're dried up let me get a handle on where I'm to here and so I can explain that to you this is what they look like underwater this is what they look like when the tide goes out, right? If they're in that area. And so we never seen that or this anywhere at any time. We never seen any Clintons. Uh, and there's quite a few different variations of those. We never seen the tidal pools had nothing in them, zero, that a bird will starve to death on any of the beaches. So the migratory animals, the 140 species, that normally depend upon the low tide and the migratory mud flats and everything else, there was nothing there. We need to go out and reinvestigate with high quality. So we're getting up to that part what uh, what we done real soon here. There was no hermit crabs anywhere on any of the rocks. There was no snails, there was no limpets, there was no nothing. It was devoid. And we're gonna show you all that coming up. This is what normal habitat looks like to me and every other commercial diver in British Columbia. I also dove the Atlantic uh, Eastern Seaboard extensively and I spent most of my life doing that. I did spend a lot of my life picking sea urchins because that was a huge industry and so even in the shallowest waters these will stick out and you see the kelp in the background on the rocks this is the normal what you expect to see everywhere you went and you would expect to see some of these big starfish. The habitat down just below the surface just below the low tide line is actually the low tide line or the, the top 30 feet high tide line, low tide line is the, the nursery of the ocean is the better way to put this to you. This is where all the little itty bitty creatures are going to hang out where all the oxygen and the ocean comes in and crashes and liberates the oxygen from the molecules and the atoms or you know hitting the coastline and this is where it's just rich oxygen and that's why it's considered the nursery. The first 30 feet also gets the colors. After that you get shades of gray. And what that translates into is photosynthesis in the ocean, at the top, at the top part of the ocean. And that biohabitat is missing. And we're almost to that point right now. Once again, I want you to really understand the significance of not seeing uh, the 60, 70, 80 species that are indigenous British Columbia water of sea anemones. Not seeing them is the only red herring anybody really would need if they're a marine biologist, a fishery officer, or anything else. And when you cover 200 kilometers of coastline that you know is notorious for being pristine, and these are all the samples. Now let's jump into what we've done. We went all the way up to Molly's Reach, and so just for um, 
Molly's Reach is around right around where I'm to right now. We're moved around a bit because we got Terry here, and Terry went, was out on all the beaches. Terry done all the walk and hurt his ankle, kept going regardless. Nine days, low tides. The last tide we we tried that we got up uh, left here at 4:30 in the morning, and we never missed one. We understood. Here's another shot of me on groups at Wakefield Beach, and we found we're coming to all of that now. And so let's get started, folks. Now this is outside of Lund. This is about two kilometers south of Lund. And that's um, this side, south of Vancouver side of Desolation Sound. And let me bring you back that chart so I can give you some context. So uh, I gotta get, pull my hand back. At the top up there, well, up there is Desolation Sound. And so when you come back, I can't reach up there because my fingers will disappear. But you can see a name up there. It says, um, I can't even read it. But the top of that island, basically, on the shoreline is the sample. And I know this is rushed and everything because we got so much to get through. But we're going we're gonna to start there with the show. And we're going to show you what, a, what the beaches starts to look like. And when you come up close, you see no whelks, you see no snails. You see no limpets, you see no sea anemones, and you barely see any vegetation. There is only four types of vegetation, or two types of vegetation. Algae was the popcorn kelp, also known um, as kelp weed. And I'll, we'll give you some really good close-ups of that here in a few moments. And we'll just wait till we get to that point, I guess is better. Now this is low tide, a couple of kilometers south of Lund. And that's up from Powell River. You can see there's no uh, kinds of vegetation life there. We'll get much more details coming up here for you. The mussels we're seeing are one generation, which is normal. And they're the indigenous mussels. And there's these little tiny patches once in a while you find of them. And so don't be fooled by a close-up shots. We'll get much better qualities coming up for you. And now the kelp you're seeing is the only kelp you'll see throughout the 16 spots we're going to try to get through. So we got to keep moving because we got a lot to get through. You're going to see, and we'll get a lot of close ups coming. We got a lot of close ups coming. And uh, I jumped ahead on you, sorry. So a few miles south of Lund, let me backtrack. A few miles south of Lund, we get up to the beaches. We're, only, we're going to put everything up with the nuclear proctologist after the show. And we have a live stream coming up tonight. Now the rocks on the first couple of beaches, we really didn't understand the significance of what we were looking at and what we were doing. You got to realize we had a little tiny budget and that we went out with a theory not understanding what we were up against and what we were going to find. Not understanding that, you know, as the days progress. And so that's why you're going to see things the way you're going to see them. But here's the kelp that is notorious throughout the video. And that's called kelp weed. And then you can see the green stuff, the fluorescent, is what... And that was a couple of miles, once again, south of Lund. I kind of made a mistake by showing you the other pictures early. But we got a lot to get through. I apologize. And let's keep going. Now, that's fluorescent type stuff you've seen in that picture uh, is uh, lettuce kelp. And it's very straggly. It's very patchy. There's no bull kelp, there's no insects. As you look into the pool, once again, there's no life there. So let's jump over to the desktop presenter. And let's get over and get into the real stuff. Um, i got to go live with that to make sure it works. I'm going to be just a, like a minute kind of figure this out. We'll bring up everything. So Gibson, or a few more miles further outside, I already covered it. Let me get rid of that and open that all up for you. Hang on, folks. So it can get pretty confusing, I know. And so we're going to take our time, make sure it all shows up over here. This is a few extra miles past the last spot, south of Lund. And I'll come back to the church for you after. No, that's the same spot. That's the shoreline. Okay, so the next folder is the one I wanted. <laughs> that's bound to happen because I'm actually, we've been through so much. So the next spot is Gibson, Gibbons. Gibson's, is this the name of the park? It's a park. Gibson. Gibson. It's a provincial park on the way to Lund, on the seaside. And 
these shelves, most of these are dead. Right, you can see they're they're not. Um, most of these are open up, and that's normally spawn out. So the ocean is still trying to spawn out. Now you can see the two types of kelp we're talking about, and the pictures will get much better as the moments go on here, folks. But we got what we got because we had a tiny budget to work with, and but we did do really good. We went and got a stand after these pictures, and so this was a couple of miles. Everything we walked, Terry walked through every pictures. Because we can't show you everything, but we're going to put everything up on the site. And this is what I was going to try to show you. And we'll run through these people. This is Wellington Beach. This is Powell River. So this affects a lot of people. So it's quite devastating. All of this is very devastating because it affects everybody on the planet. But it personally affects me because this is where I live. And so the bull kelp, once again, and the fluorescent kelp is dominating. There was no life there. This is a park. At the top of the picture, you can see a limpet. There's a limpet there, and there's a starfish. You can't see him, but there's one starfish there. Once again, right along the, 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 wharfy, the wharfing area where it was normally tons of life, there was no life. And that was Wellington Beach in Powell River. So we'll get up to the good stuff. Brew Bay is down the road. Now, Brew Bay had no life whatsoever except for four species. It had, and we'll, I don't know if there was any purple starfish here. There was only one or two at the other places, but we got so much to get through. We'll get some high quality coming up here, some higher quality. And we're going through a lot of pictures today. Uh, and you can see what I mean by patches, just little patches of mussels, nothing else. No insects, no sand fleas, no flies, uh, no, no crows. No indigenous wildlife whatsoever. Uh, there was no activity on the ocean. All the birds were missing. All the bull kelp is missing. Uh, you can see some of uh, the barnacles are hanging on. Most of it is dead. There is now. What's important is you see that twine on the mussel. That is missing from most of the mussels. But in this place, at least we we're finding that. And we got to keep going. I don't know how many pictures I got here. I'll, I'll flash through the pictures. But everything is going to go up on a nuclearproctologist.org. Uh, once again, all we find is mussels. All we find is nothing. Devoid of all life. Devoid of all habitat. Devoid of the indigenous species that we expect to see. Um, that kelp you see in there is not even healthy. But it's still trying. It's still showing up. It's just single generations of anything that we see. It's obvious to me that this happened quite a while back, that this was an extinction event, um, you know, in the sake of everything on the shoreline was wiped out in, in a short period of time. And so the disposition would have came over from Japan because it was three melter reactors. And so that came over and it continued to come over. And so that continued to wash out to the coastlines. And we get heavy rains in British Columbia. It's total desolation. We don't see any recent dead life. We don't see any carcasses. We didn't see any kind of anything clinging to a rock that didn't look like it was trying to uh, fall off the rock. Dead. Oh, and now that picture back there, you can see there's some oysters. Oysters? I can't even pronounce it. Oysters. Yeah. Oysters. There is some oysters right there, folks. And you can see some mussels are hanging on. Some of the bigger mussels, they were unusual. We didn't see them anywhere else. And the name of this place was... Um, That's in Gibson's. No, that was... Um, hang on, I'll get the folder up. That was uh, Brew Bay Road. Oh, yes. Brew Bay Road. and But the pylons never had no sea anemones, no starfish, no uh, kind of uh, life. It just had the same thing everywhere you went. Everything was devoid of life. There was no whelks, no snails. There was no uh, limpets. There was none of the normal indigenous critters that I'm used to seeing my whole life on the ocean. So we'll switch off that and keep going. And we've got lots here. As we go further down the road, we we look harder. That's a little bit further down the road. That's another popular beach I usually go to. And I didn't clue in like everybody else until the last nine days when it really struck home for me in the boat ride. That's where we clued in. And you can see it's totally devoid. And if you don't know what that looks like, We'll run back to the wire cast for a second and we'll show you what some of that life should look like. 
On the shorelines, you would expect to see a low tide. Uh, lots of these little types. There's all types of these snails. They are very dominant. In the tidal pools, you would expect to see a very rich and vibrant. You would expect to see all kinds of uh, sand dollars. You would expect to see um, all kinds of starfish, all kinds of sea anemones. And you would expect to see them hanging off the rocks in large groups. Let's keep going. We'll go live back to the desktop presenter. Let's roll through another bunch of these. This was a few miles down the road. These are all pristine places in between parks. And we got a lot of parks we're going to cover. Public parks here right along for 200 kilometers. Um, and that's what Desolation Sound is all like this. No different whatsoever. And the vi we got videos of that. We'll be posting that up on Beautiful Girl by Dana. I can't put that up on the Nuclear Proctologist, but I will link to over from there to those videos on the same site you're probably watching this on or linked over. And as you can see, we work with a $300 camera and we work with a $300 boat ride and everything else came out of Terry's pockets, literally and figuratively, including uh, food and fuel, transportation. And we're not saying nothing, we're just letting you know the budget we had so you can understand the quality and the things that we've done in more context. But the enormity of it is what drove us. We wanted to find life so we can say, instead of there's a total extinction, that there's serious life still living and we need to do something immediately because we know how big of a range it was. Each day became more uh, surreal to get up in the morning. It became more surreal to drive down to these beaches. Now this kelp, really good shots, Terry. You've done a good job on that. I left you out of the conversation up to now. But you're the guy who walked out here, Terry. And you had to work like a dog just to find mussels. You had to work like a dog just to get pictures of a couple of uh, starfish that will be coming up here. And there's a seagull here coming up in this picture. We'll jump ahead to that picture. And uh, it'll look a bit funny to people right here. Where's that seagull to? Is he in this picture? Yeah, here he is. He's out there by himself, and he's surrounded by four species. There's no other species, no insects, there's no marine life. This is prestigious areas. These are gorgeous, absolutely unimaginable gorgeous area. And I, I thought it was striking, utterly striking, this picture right here. This picture right here where he just looks at the water. To me, that really symbolized everything I'd seen in any bird that I had saw in nine days. And there wasn't very many of them. We can put all the birds we saw, all the mussels we saw, all the starfish we saw, at, in 200 kilometers for sure, in the back of a pickup truck, most likely in a wheelbarrow. And it's really something shocking. Uh, yesterday we hardly talked on the way home from the end. And let me explain something to you. What you're seeing here, there should be insects, there should be in entire communities just right there in that little tiny spot, just in a five foot patch, you shouldn't be able to count the different life there without spending a whole lot of time there. And there's zero. It's zero. The rocks are naked. Right around the tidal pools, there's nothing gripping onto them. Little tiny ping things are trying to hang on. But Fukushima is not going to allow that to last. And it's probably going to kill everything out there, but it can't come back. It won't kill. You know, it might leave something out there somewhere and it can repopulate. You think about a lingcock can lay, or a codfish can lay 700,000 eggs. You think about how the ocean is a soup of life, and under normal circumstances, if you were to have a freak act of nature that wiped out the coastline, the ocean, the soup of life, would repopulate it immediately. And so when you go there, and right across the board, there's nothing. But you see how that kelp is actually healthy looking. A lot of the mussels, even though they're patchy, they're trying. And so we have to try. We have to stop the lying, the madness, the, mon the, mon the maniacal lying from the, the apologists have led us to this. And the fact that journalists haven't bothered to call them out on it or to stop it and they allow it, right? And now we need, at this stage now, we have to go look at the rest of the coast. We have to assume that the entire Pacific Basin, America, Canada, Alaska, Everything, Vietnam, everything is going to have these same probabilities. And you can go down at low tide and take pictures. It's that simple. And if the life is missing, 
than we have it across the board. But the north, the 26,000 islands up here that I dove year after year, well, I'm going to have to go back there. I'm going to have to go back there. We're going to have to launch an expedition, and we'll keep going to go up just so we have hope. So we have to know, because this is not localized, because what the ocean does is it repopulates it. If you went down to a beach that was full of life and plowed it all off, the ocean, the soup of life that it was, would populate that with babies in a matter of weeks. Everywhere you went, you see baby sea cucumbers, baby snails, baby mussels, baby sea anemones. You would see it every square inch, massive. This is what I've done all my life. And that's what makes the difference between my story and everybody else's story is I intimately understand that that deer, what you're looking at, right, there's nothing there. But when you look at it in real perspective, and I'll bring up some pictures, right, those tidal pools should look like that, even out of the water, it should look like that. See? Right? The flannas, the floras, and everything should still vividly stand out, even in the shallow pools, the sea anemones would blow themselves up. The, here's a really good picture. The whole coastline was like that. I know, I traveled it. Year after year, I stayed out there for 100 days at a time without coming ashore. I lived, eat, and breathed this all day with people that done the same thing. Um, and so I don't know what to say to people outside of, you know, I'm, I'm straight up. I'm not going to try to hide anything away from you because that that's what got us in this position in the first place. There's no kelp force anywhere to be seen. So let's run back over to the pictures. And keep going down that line. I got no idea how much time it's going to take. We're just going to keep going until it's done. We're going to come back tonight at 8 p.m. Canada Pacific time. And we're going to stream from this channel a question and answers. Okay, so I'll launch that after. We're going to put everything up on uh, nuclear proctologists and pictures and the qualities that we got and the quantities. So you can go through it all yourself. And that'll take me probably two hours after the stream is over. And then tonight we can have a debate about it. Terry's going to be back tonight, and Terry will get more to say. But we have to tell the story. Terry's been listening to this and repeating it himself now in the last couple of days. So we'll run over. I'll make sure I get everything lined up. Hang on. Uh, what am I supposed to do here? Picture. Okay. Let's jump to another beach. One, a couple of more grabs of this. As you can see, as Terry verified, and Terry's word is good enough, I don't need the pictures. But Terry got all the pictures, right? And look at the life there. What's left there is crumbs. It's just crumbs. It lived there before at some point, but it's not there now, right? Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going, folks. Back to another one. Like I said, I can't do everything today, so we'll put it all up in the site so you can get through it on your own time. This is Saltry Bay Park. Hang on. Make sure I get the right name there. Yeah, Saltry Bay, that's a provincial park. And the next one is up, 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 so that's down close to the ferry terminal. Let me give you a, go back and give you some context. Just hang on. I'll give you some context with a picture. So that's down, uh, that's up. <laughs> Got to get my finger back. So that little island right there, um, about the top end of that island, about five, five dots back, uh, somewhere around that area. We'll put it all up on the website with some better details and we'll have a cleaner pictures for you, everybody to be able to look at after. So let's go back to the presentation and keep going. Uh, let me get that out of the way. Now we're at Saltry Bay Park. That's the name of it. And there was a starfish there, purple. That's the only starfish that we've seen was purple. I'm not sure what's going on there. And you can see the little tiny life around it. There's a little snail deer, and a little snail deer, and a little snail deer. And there's a little tiny bit of sea anemones. This is a $300 camera we're using. And you can see there's nothing in these little pools. They're not the cleanest, but we got them for you. But you can see the life on the rock. It's void and missing. See? Everything is void. It's just the remnants, the skeletons of what used to be there that should still be there. Now, that popcorn kelp you see in, what I call popcorn kelp is called kelp weed, if you're looking for it. So it was the purple starfish, the kelp weed. You can see a little bit of sponge 
uh, one of the 80 and 90 species of sponge is still there. The ocean is still trying to hang on. But we're only talking all together, maybe 10 or 15 species, right? And very tiny amounts of it that we're finding, very trace amounts of anything that we're finding. Here you can see there's a few whelks. Hang on, I'll blow it up for you. And I kind of lost the scroll. We'll drag it up. Hang on, folks. Right, we got a couple of whelks. That is such a rare picture. Those whelks are very, very rare. But the least they're trying, the least they're hanging on. We've got to stop that radiation. Because right now they're going to disappear. Nobody can doubt that. Because what goes on is there's every minute there's a plume. 1,440 minutes a day. And every day there's a plume. After 132 days, because every, every day, 24 hours, at 2 miles an hour, the plumes are dispersing and spreading out. But because they're accumulative. And because of the way they work. And because of all the laws you've been told and that we try to help you. So that's an encouraging picture. That is so encouraging to see these little whelks. Because I can guarantee you, you won't see them just about everywhere else you look. It's just these rare, very tiny spotty areas. And that's why we need super high quality equipment. And we probably might need to get an arc and go out and start grabbing this stuff. And so we're talking about an enormous operation all of a sudden that we had no concept before that was necessary. But we truly are talking about a apocalyptic event for the Pacific Ocean. Cancer takes 5, 10, 15 years to manifest. I think mammals and humans have still got time to coexist with the coastline. But I don't know for how much longer what we need to do is start exploring and confirming and getting better quality images and you know a better way to... I don't know if we can do any better than what we've done. I don't think anybody can go out there and beat what Terry done. Terry fought me and argued about staying longer and getting pictures. And I was, no, Terry, let's keep going. We got to hit the tides. We got nine days to cover all of this distance. And we just, we can come back. We have, but we can prove it with what we got. But the first couple of days, we really didn't get it, Terry. No, we didn't. No. It's only day five, day six that I really had the narrative. That I had went out and found the pictures and said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So it's good old-fashioned gumshoe research that got us to a point where at least we try. Right? At least we try. But the devastation and the amount of people and industries and families and individuals that are affected and impacted hasn't lost me. We need to find out more. And we need to know more. And... We hate to think that this is what it is, what we see, but we understand that the coastline populates itself instantly. And the fact that we don't find a population, even tiny bits of it, just a select few. In total, I think we'll come across about 10 species, and that'll include birds. We've never seen any crows. Well, I think we might have seen one crow, Terry. Uh, now that I think of it, I think we got a picture actually in the background with a crow. Well, here's a couple and, of crows, not many. Yeah, it was so rare. Well, I've never seen any eagles on any beaches. I've never seen anything eating on any beaches. I've never seen any insects. All we've seen was this, and this is a good example here. And you can see, right, the kelp, that's known as a kelp weed, is right there. And you can see the kelp, it's trying to hang on. It's, 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 it looks like, you know, the, it's just so spotty. We'll keep going through these pictures. We'll move on to the next spot here in a moment. Another close-up shot for you. It's definitive. Oh yeah, there's that sea whelk. Look at him. Yeah, I remember him. Right? He and he's so unusual. There's, I think that might be one there. And once again, um, we're we're not finished with what we're doing, but we we had the nine days of low tide to the lowest tide. Each day was lower, so we were able to learn more and get more to uh, put together for us. And once again, it's all just the kelp weed and the deadness. It's just a wasteland. Let me go back to uh, once again remind anybody that might be joining us what is actually going on and missing from the equation. Most so of it's gone. It's gone, look. Most of it's gone. None of that, and all of that is British Columbia's coastline. This is what they say, go down and look for it. You'll find it, find a tide pool, and you'll see it anywhere. We went 200 kilometers. We, we, are, we went nine days, the lowest tide each day, and this is what we found. Now, I know people are going to say, Dana, it's too depressing, and I can't deal with it. And don't you dare say that to yourself. Don't you dare think that way. Don't you dare fall for that. You are power, and you need to exert that power and understanding 
on yourself and upon the people around you because what we're doing is we're empowering you. This is Salty Bay Provincial Campground because they can no longer, they can no longer say, ah, you guys are crazy, it doesn't impact anything. You guys will say it's the most, I know what you'll say because I know what you're here, what you're feeling. And you have to compose yourself and think that you ha you came this far, you brought us to this level, and you have to go and think about that we got to try because it's still trying, right? The nuclear industry is toast. You know, they got a guilty conscience at this stage when they catch this, when they find out about this. And, like, everything else don't matter anymore. Wars don't matter anymore. The divide, the race, the religion... You know, it doesn't matter anymore, right? Your wealth doesn't matter to you anymore. You can trust me on that. Your assets are worthless unless you try and resolve what we got. We have to try to move on. There's 4,300 peer review academic studies every day. Don't you dare tell yourself that there's nothing we can do. Don't do that. Because we can if we decide we're going to. And we're not asking. We're telling them. We're taking it back. That's the way it's going to be. We gave you every opportunity and all the equipment, everything you ever needed in the system out there to guard us against this, and you fail us. You abrogated every responsibility you've ever had. We let you get away with it, and so we blame ourselves. But now we're here, and now we got you, and now there's no turning back, and now you have to join us, or we're going to get rid of you and move Never on. It's not too late. Never it's too not late. too late. We don't give up. That's what we're known for. But what you're seeing is the ocean is not giving up either. And you better not. You better hang in tight. And I know this is the shock. This is the nightmare. This is this is the, the broken dreams and the heartaches. But this is not the end of us. And it goes on, right? We go on, but we go on now that we take back control. We take back authority, and we have the distrust, unfortunately, and rightly so, that they have earned. They, they have their checks and balances if they exist any longer. We'll be scrutinized beyond imagination from here on out till the end of time. We can name the starfish now. You can name the starfish on the beaches and remember the names, yeah? Right? You can really do it. And you can see little patches in nooks and crannies of, of, of stuff trying to survive. And if I show you everything I got here, that is all you're going to see on every beach and every document of everywhere we went. It was this cabbage kelp barely hanging on anywhere. It was rags and nothing else. No habitat. There was no insects. There was no life. There was nothing there to sustain life. There was nothing there for wolves or raccoons that, that or birds. That picture there was just a stick that had a bunch of the mussels. And that stick it. washed in. And so... A big area. And that was a big stick, right? Yeah. So well, let's move on to another part of these provincial parks. This is further down the coast. Remember, these are provincial parks. All right, that's Salty Bay. i got to jump ahead one. This is taken... Hang on, folks. We got a lot to get through yet. Sultry Bay Provincial Park Campground. I missed that one, did I? I think so. Yeah, we jumped past the campground because that was the next one. This is the campground. Sultry Bay, before you get down to the ferry. It's very protected. It's very pristine country. The nearest community to it, right, there's a couple of little tiny outports with 50 people or something like that. The nearest communities are, you know, 20 kilometers away to habitat, ha habitable communities. This is a very pristine area, naked, just like the 200 kilometers of coastline that we covered, completely and utterly naked, devoid of everything, everywhere we went. Look at the whelks, eh? At least they're trying. At least we got some. At least we found a few. There's nothing else in these tide pools, and we all know what lives in a tide pool. I'll go back to those pictures, but I thought that was really poignant. Look at them. There's a couple of those little black ones. They're trying, folks. They're trying to hang on. Right? We have one opportunity, and I can trust you, this is the end of the opportunities that we have. This is the end of that opportunity. We grab that now, we seize that moment now, when we have the ability and we have the righteousness to do it and to bring it all back. We don't know if we can ever bring back the ocean, but we got, we're got we in a position to try. Review academic studies every day. We're not going down without... A fight. They have to go and hide. They have to go and bury their heads in shame. Everybody in the nuclear industry has to hang their head in shame. They can't look anybody, including their own loved ones and the family after today. We won the battle, but now we have to control it. Now we have to make sure we keep it. 
the fight is not going to be hard. The resistance is not going to be many, right? The, you know, the, we have we have taken the wind out of their sails and our sails, unfortunately, at the one time. But we have this opportunity now, and that's what we're doing, right? We're coming out. We're not coming out like an army. We're coming out with the common sense that we can we can talk to their families. We can talk to their children. We can talk to their mothers and their daughters. We can bludgeon them that way. Right? We, we can go after them, and we will, and we have, and we are going to, because that is just the way it will be, because people will snap if they don't get this narrative. That's why this narrative is so important. This narrative, by the end of it, you got that picture. I don't need to exist anymore in the context of you can do it all on your own at that stage. But I will go. We covered 9,000 headlines on this site of nuclear industry. And trust me, they're not going to get one over on me. And I'm making sure it's not going to happen to you. Okay, let's jump to another set of pictures. Uh, let me, was there anything interesting there I forgot? Terry, that was the one with the, okay, we'll jump out of it. There's, like you say, nothing anywhere we go. We still got seven more in this file here to get through. So let's keep running. Sultry Bay Ferry Terminal. So this was important. So I'll come back to another picture so you can understand why the ferry terminals and everything are important to me in particular. And you should see that on the coastline, see? And on the ferry terminals on the legs of it, they should be sticking out underwater and hanging off the water at the surface because that is the norm. Everybody who ever took these ferries can now go and look at the pictures they took because that's where most people get their pictures. And they would have got a pictures anybody over the years and everybody in the academic community and the scientific community knows what I'm telling them is true. Nobody can argue with me. Nobody can argue with the pictures Terry took because they're good enough to tell the difference. We only had a $300 camera to work with. That doesn't mean we got defeated. That doesn't mean we gave it up when we never found life. That means we put together a plan. So let's go back to the presentation. Let's go back to the presentation. Now a good thing about all of this is that I'm kind of fortunate and so this is the Sultry Bay Ferry Terminal and uh, let me come back and give you some context again I'm sorry I take a second just to make sure you know what we're talking about in case you're just joining us right behind me I'm sorry at the top of this island right behind me is a ferry that brings you over to this island here and that's Gibson's Island to head down to that's New Westminster and this is all supposed to be prestigious Straight to Georgia material. Let's go back to the presentation. I make sure I'm live before I try to do it. And so, Sultry Bay Ferry Terminal didn't have anything on its shorelines around the ferry terminal. It's had the same thing we found for 200 kilometers. There was nothing on the pylons, right? And remember, this is a couple of days before the super moon, so the tides are super low. As you can see, there's nothing there, and there's no communities down there. It's just that ferry terminal. There is nothing on those. Nothing. No sea enemies. One starfish. I see one there. starfish. There he is. Right. Good one, Terry. Yeah. There was one orange starfish. In fact, that was probably the only two orange starfish we've seen in 200 kilometers. You can see some mussels up higher. Right. Nothing. Devoid of all life. I think. Um, a few oysters there. A few oysters. Right. We're looking for sea enemies. We don't see any on the pylons that they should stand out dramatically. You should be able to see them right there. And these pictures will all go up at the nuclearproctologist.org two hours after this is over. Once again, excuse me, you can see that's uh, up there. You can't see it, but he's a uh, oyster, right? Now, we know oysters are, are uh, they had a spawn of oysters at Penbrook. I think it was Roger was telling us. Roger, our buddy, is a mussel expert. And so he was able to explain, explain why the mussels that we were seeing were able to hang on in patches. And trust me, they were in patches. And you can see, even on the railings, steel rails that would normally be covered in big sponges and everything else have nothing on it. So let's jump. Oh, we got to zoom in on it. Hang on. There you go. That's a better picture. You can see nothing. There's a bit of a, it could be rust, but it could also be some sponge you see down there in the corner. And so let's keep going. No, that's rust. Um, and then you see the green algae. So let's go back to another set of uh, places. This is where we jumped on the ferry. We zoomed in on the coastline. We took 400 pictures. They'll be uploaded to the site. And they're not there. They're just more of the same. They're around the terminal itself. Hang on. There's a picture of the ferry. 
I think. Picture of the ferry, what have we got here? We zoomed in on the shorelines as we're coming around the points, and there was nothing there either. It was the same vegetation, the same desolation. And so what we done was we took, we done the best we could with a $300 camera, and we zoomed in on the entire coastline, every opportunity, and we got some pretty good shots, enough to tell. And we're going along the ferry, we got 400 of these. 400, and none of them shows any kind of vegetation outside of what we see is atypical of the 200 kilometer coastline. I'll motor through it all for us. And once again, the fluorescence stands out. And that's displacing all the native indigenous uh, creatures that live in that habitat, right? There's no, uh, so the limpets and everything, the snails and all that, they can't coexist in that, they need their own little tiny habitat to exist. And so we covered over 700, uh, 400 pictures of that. We'll upload all of those to the site. And now we went to Smuggler's Cove, coming up. And I'll bring you up some context for that, folks. And I know we're going through a pretty, pretty hard, pretty fast, pretty devastating. 200 miles of coastline. This is Vancouver Island, 460 kilometers. This is a 200 kilometer zone we covered. And we're going over to the islands behind me. We took the ferry over. See that big island up there, the big dot, the red dot, the, the long one? Well, the ferry terminal comes around that point, and then the dot behind it uh, is where we come onto the island. And then as you come out, the first dot is Smuggler's Cove kind of area. It's just meant to be a representation of it. So here we go over to the presentation again. We're coming over to Smuggler's Cove. And Smuggler's Cove it was like everywhere else. There was no insects on that highway. We found no insects in 200 kilometers of roads, none smashing into our windshield. None into the bumper. There was none on the shoreline. There was no other types, anything crawling around like sea fleas. There was no interaction with birds. There was no crows. It was utter devastation. This is in Smuggler's Cove, and it was the same thing. This is one where I kind of got impatient with Terry. Terry went out of sight, and I yelled out, Terry! I'll show you the picture of probably where he was too. It zooms in. So he was down getting these pictures because that's what I told him to do. And now he's down there getting a the picture because I told him to go down there. And now he got to put up with me yelling, Come on, Terry. Let's go. Because when I went down, I went down in the wheelchair to the edge. I yelled out to Terry originally. I said, Is there anything there, Terry? He said, No. And after thinking about it for a minute, I was like, We need to get, because we had one tide to cover 80 kilometers. So we had to go spot to spot to spot. And we just got defeated at the end of it. We went all the way to the end. And so let's go, um, let's jump back and cover some of these spots here where I left off. Just to kelp uh, weeds is all we found. And we found uh, the kelp. And once again, you know, Terry went down and was adamant that he had to get at least a couple of high quality pictures before he was going to put up with me rushing them on these particular shots because we had one tide 80 mile kilometers to cover and you can only draw it, it's all nooks and crannies at 40 kilometers an hour lots of traffic and I wanted to get across that island for the tide come up too high and so this one in particular was the one I rushed Terry on and we got and we just there was no life there I was defeated but I got my second wind back and let's go over that was Smuggler's Cove we did find a starfish Terry, you found one. That's where I was yelling at you. Here's Terry on the beach. He's looking around. That's just total fucking chaos. Excuse the language. Okay, we went on to Pender Harbor. We found a bunch of starfish, which gave us a little bit of hope. Uh, look at that. That was the only, in 200 kilometers, the only time we saw that. Once again, we've done it on a small budget. We rented a high-powered boat for three hours, covered desolation sound, and it was desolation. There was nothing. Well, and then we, we took $300, got a camera, and then we went all along the coastline because we realized in absolute horror that we had no choice now but to document it. And that took us nine days of low tides, catching the lowest tide each day. And that's Terry's shadow. And all is dear is the same thing. Look, and that was um, Pender Beach, and, and we had hope. Look, there's purples everywhere, but the 63 other species of starfish are missing, right? Sorry, let me get that back up for you. 
and the 63 other species and then the 56 other species of the indigenous population. Look how low that tide is. If it wasn't a really low tide, we wouldn't have seen them. But everything else is just vegetations and vegetables. Let's get to the next one. We never stopped. I was at it all night. I never slept. We've been at it all morning to get this just even. And that's why we're using the desktop presenter because I can't get through it all. I still got stuff on the computer and the wire has to get through before we give it up. Okay, this was Sergeant Bay Provincial Park. Sergeant Bay Provincial Park, for context, you can see it. Let's bring it up a little bit better for you. That's um, uh, right around where my finger is, area, right? On the island right behind my head here. So we're at the bottom of the 200. The top part, uh, the top part way up at the top is Desolation Sound. It's 200 kilometers down to where I am right now where my head is too. And we went all the way down to there. And let's go back to the presentation. Because that's all I can say, folks. I can't get emotional, and I can't get anything. All the steam is taken out of me. It's all taken out of me. I got no wind left in my sail. I just want to get on with solutions. I want to get on with exploring the rest of the coast with real equipment. I want to document everything we went through all the way up. And then I want to assume that the rest of the country, I'm going to hope. That's all I got is that we can stop the reactors and at least it might come back. But if we don't stop it, if we don't stop Fukushima, there is no hope for that. 50% of the oxygen, the biggest ocean on the planet, 200 miles of pristine, 200 kilometers of pristine coastline, it all looks the same. It has nothing. It has the kelp, the, um, it has the cabbage kelp, the kelp weed, the purple urchin, and what's the other one? I can't even remember. I haven't shut up. Here we go. Keep going anyway. Here's your kelp. It's very patchy, very tiny. No matter what we found in 200 kilometers, we could have fit it all in the back of a pickup truck when you shouldn't be able to fit it in a thousand, pick a thousand transport trucks, a million transport trucks. you got to remember that low tide area is the nursery of the ocean, and the ocean is broken, and that's why it didn't repopulate, right? It's as simple as that. The links below are to all the government websites. It's not even trying. And it all got wiped out at the one time. It all got devastated at the one time. Everything is naked. There's four species left. There's the snails, the kelp, weeds, the green kelp, which is a kelp cabbage, I believe, and then the mussels. The indigenous, one type of mussel only, nothing else. 63 species, starfish missing. Uh, 90 species of sponges missing. Some of them showing up in little bits. Like that rock up here. Can you see that there? That rock right there. There's little sponging going on there. There's some on that. See, there are these patches. The ocean is still trying. It's still trying. But because these plumes are going into the ocean and they hit it from us and they're sending the homeless in there to stop it and they're not even trying. They're dumping it into the ocean the day and yesterday and the day before because they know what we're doing. They want to get it all, dump it all off the site before the opposition says you got to take your money and do something ethical. They're saying to hell with you. They're dumping it into the ocean. They know what's going on. They know all of this is missing. We're just finding out. And to me, we got to go the rest of the way. We just can't stop here. All these pictures will show up on the nuclearproctologist.org. I don't care. I'm going to go every day because I got no choice now. All my hopes and dreams. And more, you know, are long gone, same as Terry's. And this kelp weed is just one generation. That's all you're seeing. You're not seeing old generations. Look at these purple starfish. That's all you're going to see. You're not going to see another uh, type of starfish. Let's hope they survive. And if they don't, so if those four species go, there's nothing else. That's why there's no crows. That's why there's no insects. That's why there's no. It is not enough deer to feed anything unless they want to live on four pieces of food when they should be living on 5,000 opportunities and 600 types of algae. And all we see is four, up to 10, if you count the little tiny itty bitties, and we do, because that's all we got to go on. Let's go to our next spot. You can see it. The kelp is still healthy, but all the other kelps, all the bull kelp that is normal and typical and atypical of the entire coastline, and let me reinforce that for you, because I dove in this all the time, every day, day in, 315 days a year, 
this is what I understand. And this is habitats where birds will dive underneath it and feed on the kelp stalks where all the creatures will live. <coughs> and this is what I'm used to. Six hours a day, right by myself on the ocean floor working. This is what I understand. And what's missing is something I'm very intimate with. And that's why we're doing what we're doing today. And that's why we're begging you. That's why I begged you at the beginning of the video to contact people that have influence and stat status and, and, you know, TV stations. Somebody there must have some moral or ethical. Somebody must be able. I know that you would rather have some institution come out and tell the story. I know all of that. I get all of that. They're liars. But that no one will trust you again. You have to tell our story. That is the issue. And I don't like it any more than you do. Trust me. I don't want to be sitting here. I don't want to be known as this guy today. I really don't. And Terry is not sitting here because, but he's sitting here because he understands you need something, right, to understand that there's not me, right, that we went out together and this is our story. There's no and, bullshit. And that ocean does not look anywhere, any at any places. It resembles nothing like what we're seeing three and a half years ago. It was like that three and a half years ago. Every spot that I showed you was like that three and a half years ago. Every single spot. And they got wiped, all of them got wiped out to one time. And that accounts for the lack of whelk, shells, and molluscs. That accounts for all the missing limpets. And these are usually, every rock is, my whole life, I've always said if I had a berry picker, I can fill the boat up with whelks or snails. And I can't find one. And people are going to say that this is not an issue and that uh, this never happened. Then you need to, to take back what is yours, right? So let's keep going. I think everybody gets it at this stage. I don't think I need to drive that point home quite so much. But uh, you got to understand we're breaking this story. Wakefield Beach Access. That's the one you see me stood up with my sticks. And that's a pretty rare picture, folks. You got to realize what we've done here is I spent 15 years in a hospital bed in a wheelchair. And I can't stand normally more than a half an hour or an hour doing anything. And we just went nine days to the point where we were in the truck yesterday. I could, Terry was going to get out just so I could have the seat, but it didn't make any difference. I have a pressure relief mattress. But there's a dead starfish, look. Uh, there's nothing else there. And there's a fly. Do you got any idea if you knew how rare that insect is? If, if you went with us, if you went with us, that would be iconic of the entire trip. None hit our windshields. I think we counted three or four or five uh, altogether insects, maybe ten. We could fit every insect we seen in a tumbler, in a one shot, a one ounce glass. That includes on the shoreline. That includes everything that crawls. And so the game is over, see? We, we, we are in serious trouble, no matter what we do from here on out. But what, what we can't do from here on out is more of this. And so we have to go out and verify with extremely quality material, equipment. Like We're talking about a huge operation. And so that's why I'm saying it to you, because I'm stunned that the only way we're going to have a, a revolution, a resolution, is we do it ourselves. And we can't no longer not do it ourselves. And I don't want to do this. I don't even know if I'm capable. I know I'm, I have the ability. I have the history. I have the litany. I have the skills. Right? And I have Terry, who's well-versed. We have Roger, who ran Muscle Farm. He's on Muscle Farm for 25 years. He's well-versed. He's on the ocean every day. So we have skippers. We have divers. But to do this, we need cameras underwater to drag along the coastline at the same time because you only got a two-hour low tide a day to go in and explore all this. We need a huge, massive budget. We can't trust them. We have to go out. We have to be the check and balance because they're going to go out and they're going to show us old pictures. We want to stream it out live, 1,440 minutes a day, never off, always on. And if we can get to that... If you can get to that, the foundation that we can create has a chance. We can leave something. But right now, folks, I'm telling you, it's not a game. It's not a game. We didn't do what we've done because we, we were hoping, against hope, that we could find something. Here's seashell. I missed all of that. I've got no idea what I've done with that. I must have put it in. I'll find it in a second. 
Gibson's Fury terminal. Gibson's Fury. There's nothing on that side of it, of the Fury terminal. I got no idea. That's it there, is it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the one defense. That's the one defense. Okay, just make sure it's on the right one. It's not very good. You wouldn't believe what we've done to get these shots. This is out by New Westminster. And you were not allowed out there. Terry ran out there and got no, no, pictures. No. It's not by New Westminster. That's, that's, uh, well, that's the ferry that goes over to New Westminster, isn't it? It goes over to Horseshoe Bay. It goes to Horseshoe Bay, that ferry does. And I dove Horseshoe Bay, and it was full of sea anemones and all life, seabeds. But once again, there's no life. It's just the same. It's just the same four products everywhere we went. Okay, let's come back over. I kind of I screwed up, I guess. Molly Reef. Let's go to Molly Reef, and I'll give you some context. Let's jump back over to Molly Reef for a second. Molly Reef would be right, uh, right, right alongside of my thumb, right? And that's where it's a very famous spot. That whole coastline is full of half million dollar homes. It's very prestigious. Um, it's a very luxury area, and there was zero life there. So let's go back and look at Molly Reach. And everything else will show up on the website in a few hours at thenuclearproctologist.org. And I'll put that link below. And then I'll put a link below once I get the link started on the Nuclear Proctologist to link directly to the section where we're going to put this. We're at Beautiful Girl by Dana. There's a... Um, there's a... Uh, Relics. One of the... That's one of Relics' girl. boat, wasn't it? Is that what that was? I think it's part of it. I see Original Punisher mentioned last night. He was in the boat and got pictures. Right? He went and got that... Uh, I can't even pronounce it. So that's Molly Reach. It's very iconic. It's a very well-known place. It's a very wealthy area. And like some of these places, I'm not surprised to find much life, right? There's the marina there at Molly's. But that's the marina. But we're surprised not to see any sea anemones on these whatsoever or any life deer whatsoever. And so that confirms everything is going to be the same. We took that because it's iconic and we never bought it. you got to realize we're racing along the coastline. And it's, we're going down all these duds trying to get at beach access. And so we need a boat to go along the whole coastline of Canada and record it with high quality and upload it all the time, preferably live, and pref at least preferably uh, every few hours. And we need more than one or two people doing it. We need more than one boat. We're talking about 26,000 islands, but we need to make a consensus along the coastline. And uh, right, you can see a few... And we need to treat a few, a few, uh, a few uh, uh, whelks, a few uh, limpets have survived there, and that's about it, though. And everything else is the green, fluorescent, the just very sparse, and the other 5,600 species are all missing. So these are all, uh, uh, you know, underwater at the, the toys, and you can see there's only two algaes there, the green. Um, trying to get a hold here. He's re that's just trying to get a foothold here. And the other one is. I always have a hard time with that. The kelp weed. I have a hard time saying that name. And then here's a crow. That was a crow I was talking about. That was the only crow we've seen in 200 miles on a beach. He looks hungry. <laughs> and he's starving. There's nothing there. There's no insects. Yeah, no kidding. There's nothing there to chew on. I got five thumbs, <laughs> five thumbs down. Five thumbs down for showing you the truth. Five people out there decided that they were going to turn their back on the entire planet, on everybody and every creature and every human. Five people done that. That is despicable. It's fucking disgusting. That is disgusting. You people sh are, should be absolutely ashamed. Absolutely, you should be humiliated. Your family should be humiliated of who you are to do that. Five thumbs down. And I'm showing you the fact. That's backed up. How dare you? How dare you insult me? Do you got any idea the significance of what we've done here? Do you got any idea that everybody else that we paid to do their job had failed you to this point that we had to take $600 and do it ourselves with nothing? And somehow we're the bad people because it's better now than later. A am I wrong? <coughs> Do we wait until it's completely all gone and then say, it's all gone? And by the way, so are you. Is that what we do? We wait. Right now, there's no insects on the shoreline. There's no insects on the highway along the shoreline. And I'm not saying this. 
I'm open with you. You can go look yourself. Anybody and everybody, every fishery department along the way, tomorrow can go out and prove me a lawyer. Go and prove me a lawyer. But make sure you put out where you were to so I can come and prove you that you're actually a lawyer. Because I got no, I got everything to lose and nothing to gain by anything I'm doing. I'm doing this because I got no choice because you won't do your job that so we paid you to do. How dare you do that to me? How dare you insult this entire planet by doing that? The only chance we got to get this message out. And somehow I'm the bad person. Somehow you have to hold on to something to finish off the rest of the planet? Don't do that to me again, please. It's completely on a call for. We All we're doing is showing you documentation. You can go to any university and you will find out that all of it is well known. That they know all the life that is there and that everything I'm showing you is correct. And that I have nothing to gain. Let me show it to you. You need to understand that. You need to see it in, 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 in for its reality and for its simplicity and for its longevity that's been long before we showed up. That was like that. The long before we showed up, long, long before we showed up, this was a thriving, and it was up to three and a half years ago, and it all went extinct in a short period because it's all missing. There's nothing left there. It's trying to regain, but it can't because it's still hemorrhaging out. It can't because we won't try. It can't because we can't have this debate until the day till we put this out there. And you can't hide from it no more. Because anybody can walk down to a beach and look themselves. Right? I mean, isn't that, isn't that what makes us different today? Is we know it's there. We can go to any institution. And they'll say, oh yeah, it's every title pool is like that, sir. Ma'am. And you say, no, it's not. And what have you done? What have you done to us? In order to keep a job and a pension, what have you done? to your own children. Now they can't even look you in the face anymore. Your your friends, your wives, your your parents can't look you in the face anymore your without being disgusted. Face. Nobody can look at you anymore without being disgusted because you knew what you done. You knew what's happened. You know what's going to happen. And you knew that if we didn't come out and try, at some point it'd be too late. And that's why you done what you done. So you can have another paycheck. So you can pretend you're a hero. So you can pretend that you're somebody special. So you can go around and pretend. That's all you've done. You hid it from us. And six hundred dollars toward that lawyer part, didn't it? Six hundred dollars and one person who walked down on the beach and took the picture and took the money out of his own pocket and made it happen. Tonight we're gonna come back. Tonight all we're gonna talk about is in the conversation section. Tonight we're gonna answer continuously as long as you're asking questions that we don't cover. We're gonna cover them for you. And so that we can have a debate after this, after today, right? Because we need to have a debate. We don't need anger. We don't need revenge right now. We need, we need resolve and we need action, right? We're going to bring that to you the best we can. You got to understand how humbling it is to be here today and tell you this and show you this and try to even articulate this and how stressful the last nine days have been, how utterly unimaginably horrific and apocalyptic every morning has been and how we celebrated every insect we saw you have to think about that we'll see you tonight it's the best I can do today folks make no mistake if I had made it last night or this morning I, I would have been a lot more angrier angrier but I, that's gone from me forever I would imagine I don't have it in me anymore I just don't have it in me but we will be back tonight we'll talk rational we'll talk sense we'll do the best we can and that's what we got to do. That's our obligation, right? Uh, we're in, the low tide line has always looked like that long before we existed. And we need to do the best we can. We got to try. And so tonight, let's talk about that. And Pacific Canada time, we'll be sitting here, we'll be reading the comments, and that's all we're going to respond to. We'll be able to bring up the desktop presenter, bring up Google, and show you and articulate anything that we can.